Welcome to MoMA PS1 Sunday Sessions with a special listening session of Wu Tang's Once Upon a Time in Shaolin. Um, thank you all for coming. And before I give you a run through of the evening, here's Alexander Jilks from Pedalate. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all so much for trundling through the snow this evening to join us tonight as we pay homage to the greatest sonic innovators, the Wu-Tang Clan. Seven albums, nine members, 22 years, 36 chambers, 40 million sales from one island, Staten Island, from one man, the Abbot, Rizza. And tonight, ladies and gentlemen, Paddle 8 is proud to partner the Wu-Tang Clan to forever ever etch the clan into the canons of contemporary culture. With this, we will be reversing the trend today whereby music has become accessible and somewhat expendable to make sure this is anchored forever in the realms of fine art. And with my partners from Paddle 8 to the Ditty and Osman, we are proud to be able to find a singular home for this work of art, and it reverses and takes us back to the old analog trends pressed into one copy, and tonight we'll hear all about it from the creators. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Thank you Alexander. So, um, as Alexander already mentioned, we have um, two very special guests, Rizzer and um, Silver Rings are here. They both work together on the album and they will come now on stage and give a very brief statement about their thinking behind the album, their work and um, also the special choice they made to only have one copy of the album. And then we are all in the very privileged situation to um, witness the first, the last, and the only listening, public listening session of Once Upon a Time in Shaolin. And that will be an excerpt of 13 minutes. And after that, we're also very happy to have Sasha Fred Jones here tonight. Um, Sasha is a New York-based musician and he was for a long time a staff writer at The New Yorker, and he's now an executive editor at Genius, and he will um, conduct a conversation with Rizzer and Silver Rings. So please welcome Rizzer and Silver Rings. Thank you. One, two, one, two, yeah, 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 yeah. My name is Derisa, the Abbot of the Wu-Tang. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you all for coming out. Cold, cold night in New York City, but uh, we here with some warmth in our hearts. On March 26, 2014, we made an announcement that had resonated throughout the world. Where we said that there would be a new Wu-Tang Clan album entitled Once Upon a Time in Shaolin but only one copy would ever exist. In doing this announcement, we reclaimed the idea that recorded music should be regarded as a work of art. And this idea would inspire some debates. Some people thought that music has lost its value, became just, uh, just a sidebar of life. And how we perceived it, it also changed when people believed that they would was entitled to music. It was just entitlement, downloaded, no more physical. The one copy concept, what is it? Well, after months of talking with experts and art people around the world, it came clear that what we was doing had no framework. It defied what the normal music industry standard was and it defied what the normal art gallery display was. Ultimately, we hope that this work that we put together could change the perception of both art and music within our culture and maybe unite them as one. Once Upon a Time in Shaolin is what I consider a seal to a musical legacy. It's a unique work of art. 
And it's an urgent statement for our times. But for more than anything, I think this idea, this concept will act as inspiration for other artists. Whether you're working on a sculpture, whether you're paintbrushes, hitting the canvas, or whether you're playing piano, guitar, artists are very rare people in our world. I'm going to give you a little mathematical thing and I'm going to pass it to my brother Tyreek, but if you was to say in the whole world you could find 10 million, just say just 10 million good artists, and you took that 10 million and you divided into the 7 billion people, you would lose it. You would lose it. So when you see an artist put his hard work, his hard time, and taking his mind power and transmitting that to his hands, his voice, his dance, his step, you're looking at something rare. Things have value when they are rare. A diamond will always be a diamond because it's a rare mineral. Once upon a time in Shaolin, it's a marker for our times. It's a rare item and tonight you'll get a chance to get a small glimpse of it i'm gonna pass on to tyreek and he'll tell you about that thank you hello welcome everyone my name is silver rings I want to thank everybody for coming today in a few minutes we'll be playing you 13 minutes of once upon a time in shaolin it will be the first and last time any music from this work will be heard by anyone else uh, besides the eventual collector for at least a period of 88 years. I um, met Riza in 1997. I was uh, reintroduced to him in 1999 by his mother. Since then, I've had the privilege of traveling the world with him and not only study the way he produced music, but to learn about the character that drove the music. In 2004, we both traveled to Egypt and spent two weeks studying its remarkable history. We were fortunate enough to have a very well-connected uh, guide who managed to get us access to the Giza pyramids after closing time. Uh, Riza and I would ride horses into the desert completely alone and have the, uh, have the pyramids pretty much to ourselves. Halfway climbing the pyramid of Cheops, we sat down to overlook the desert, and I said to Riza that one day we should do something special together that would last through the ages. That moment in 2004 when we sat upon maybe the greatest work of art mankind ever devised by man marks the time for me when this journey uh, started. We went back to move forward. And as we adopted an approach to music that traced its lineage back through the Enlightenment, the Baroque, and the Renaissance, we felt that sonically we had to travel back to the 36 chambers. What you will hear now encapsulate a journey through those chambers. Conceptually, this concept has been made clear. Today, it's about the actual work. We hope you will enjoy these next 13 minutes and understand that a genuine purpose will only last as long as the sacrifice is great. Thank you. Mind the acoustics. We try to get it as best as possible. So enjoy. So uh, my name is Sasha Ferrer Jones, and thank you for coming out. It's extremely cold, as uh, Riza pointed out. Um, that's a really intense box set right there. <laughs> I think that's like the illest album cover in the history of music, you know what I mean? In the history of the world, the illest package right there, yeah. Now, there be so many Wu-Tang fans who would want to put their hands on that, who would want to have that experience. Do you, uh, what do you imagine a Wu-Tang fan is feeling right now, thinking about this, this record, and now they know it's real, they've heard it. Sounds like a Wu record, you know? I mean, I think more than anything is, not just what, what they would feel now, but I, I always think about how the future would be, you know? And when you think about how certain things mark 
time in, in our world, in our world history, you know, we go and we dig up things and we find a dinosaur bone or we or we find a rock from an ancient civilization, you know what I mean? I think this is like a uh like a time capsule in its own way. And um I think everybody, you know, wants to take themselves into the future. It's just it's just a man is always sought a mean of immortality and the only thing that outlives all of us is our art you know Mozart is hundreds of years ago you know and yet his art his music is here with us today you know I think that for Wu Tang and the, and the fans that we acquired over the years and and even those who are not fans they could use this as a as a as a time zone as a time period reference and that's what I see. I'm looking at wow, you know. Even if I found this, if I would have found it 500 years ago, I'd be I'd be enthralled. If I found it 500 years later, you know what I mean? That's how I feel about it. That would definitely change the course of history if you found that 500 years ago. That would be <laughs> that would really mess with the whole history of music. I kind of wish. That would be great if we could say right now, actually, this is 500 years old. <laughs> that, would be, that would be really good. Um, so how did you talk to the other members of the group when you, we, essentially, let me back up for a second. You begin this six years ago. At, at that point, did you know you were making an album that there was only going to be one of? From the beginning, did you know that? No, I wouldn't say from the very beginning, right? Uh, we wanted to do something special and the, the irony of it is that we wanted to do something for the fans. And uh, so the whole idea, me, I consider myself probably the biggest fan in the world, right? Because I kind of managed to get, get in there after a couple of years of trying. And um, so the idea was to basically take him through those chambers. That, that, that style that I fell in love with, that changed the like course the first of my record. life. Yeah, I wouldn't want to, just, just that era. People will know what I mean with that era. Um, that's the style that really dominated my teenage years and changed my life. And I felt like I wanted to have one more hit of that. And, um, you know, RZA obviously always thinks miles ahead, always ahead of everyone. Was still capable of doing that, but was, was doing something else with his life. And I said to him, like, why don't we make something that's almost like a closure, sonically, for the fans. Now, it's going to be a bit difficult because brothers are not really living that life anymore to get them in that same lyrical uh, sphere and, and, and just the way they perform on the record. Like, you know, 80% of the record was re-recorded because it was also for them new that was that, that to go back to that aggressive approach and the delivery and stuff that you hear like you hear ghost is really is 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 ghost face killer again and um but right before we actually started recording it so the production was happening i think production took about two years and it took long because everything i had to send to rizza and RZA would basically just shut, shoot down everything I was doing and just kept going back and going, change that, change that. And from, you know, from the hi-hats to the smallest thing. And um, when we had it, now mind you, we had the music before we, we recorded every. We basically knew the picture, what it would look like, what, we were, what song would come first, last, middle, etc. So we were painting that already beforehand. And right when we then decided then on, on this idea, we had to apply a complete unorthodox approach to recording, to mixing, to mastering, to how we're going to let them write to it, to the song titles that we're going to choose. Like everything had to stay secret, including the idea. So that's the only way to safeguard what we're trying to do here. And um, and then I think when we I think we we finished with it about two years ago. Kind of we get to the end. That's when we kind of broke it down to. Three? Three years, yeah, three, maybe three years, yeah. Then we kind of bro started breaking it down to each member. Like, this is what we're going to do, and this is why. Yeah, but. Wait, wait, say that? So, well, the, the, well, you know, the, 
the album was recorded in secret with the members not knowing yeah. the exact outcome of they, they where it was headed. You, they didn't know what you were doing. No, they didn't know. And um, it's you know funny. It's, it's kind of when you when you are. Uh, I guess the best way I could describe it now after living through it is like when you do a movie, you go and you do a scene, but you never know until you come to the premiere, they edit you out, they cut you out, or they put more in there. So it's kind of like that revelation. But when uh, when we announced it to them that this was the plan, uh, you know, everybody, of course, agreed that it was um, a very unique idea. And what made it even more unique for me, because we discussed it many ways, like, yeah, about this message. And I just felt, you know, the, one of the most compelling things was that as, as long as we can re-identify music as a work of art, you know what I mean? That's what I want. I felt like, you know, I really felt like it was, that it was taken from what it really could be, you know? Devalued even, if you could use that word. And to re-inject value back into it, to re-inject um, admiration of it as art, that was a, a big goal for me. When you had got when he when he had commissioned Yaya to come with the uh, with the package of this, I mean, I, I wouldn't even call this a package. Everything about this is a work of art. If you notice um, from the book, from uh, the, the jewel case, the case that holds that. There's another case that goes around this. This Everything was artistically designed. And even, you know, we didn't have enough time, but he wanted to design the podium for it <laughs> because everything is continuing to express art, the work of hands, the work of minds coming together. And to me, and this is my opinion, you know, from being in hip hop and being in music, Wu Tang Clan, to me, are the nine. You know, not, well, I exclude myself. Are the eight most talented MCs that I've met in their artistic artistic expression, because their art doesn't come from an academic background. It actually comes. It's almost like how how if you see a blind man make a sculpture, but he didn't see it. You know, you go back and listen to Thirty Six Chambers, and we just lived on Staten Island in, in, the, in a small community without traveling to different parts of the world, yet you feel the world feeling of it. You know, that's what the artist is able to do. They're able to absorb, absorb it from the air, really. Absorb it from the mind and, and translate it. And so to get them together for this and to do it secretly, it was sometimes when I remember, you know, I would talk, I'd be talking to him, but he's talking to them. They don't know he's talking to me. You know what I mean? And, and for a minute, I think some of them thought that they knew a secret that I didn't know. You know what I mean? But it was cool. So that wasn't a slightly awkward call when you said, hey, guys, we we made a whole album without you. Like, that wasn't, there was no tension around that fact? No, there wasn't no tension around it. It wasn't that we made an album without you. It's just more like, I guess the best way to describe it again, another analogy is, Everybody got on a boat, but didn't know where the boat was going. But look where it landed. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Hey, it's not on Gilligan Island. You know what I mean? <laughs> right? Well, we don't we don't know which island it's going to be on yet, right? We don't know, but I think that uh, you know, you know, whoever is fortunate enough to possess this piece of history, you know, he's 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 getting you know, I'm a, I'm I'm there's a part of me envious of it actually. As a as a as a guy who's a who's into the world of collecting things, and I'm into what I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm slightly envious that you know that this will pass on to somebody else and their family and their generations. You know, there's a small bit of envy in me. I won't. I'm not shy to say that. I said it to you. I yeah. I, I put a bit in it and shit to you one time. <laughs> I, not like that, but it's just because I know that this is a a great capturing of time and time and space and capturing of it's not just the Wu-Tang Clan every member on here uh, you know we even was able to include uh, those who within the Wu-Tang circle that was touched by it you know I mean I want to 
take the whole interview, but even if you think of, you know, when you have Free, Sons of Man, Red Man, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's so many, you know, this particular um, collection of music is over two hours. It's 31 songs, right? 31 yeah. songs, y'all. I mean, Wu Tang Forever, which I guess was our biggest album, I think 25 songs on there, you know, and uh, took a long time to make as well. Not as long as it took to make this, but that helped define, you know, a generation in all reality, uh, you know. And uh, this is even more laborious than that was. Can you talk a little bit about what will happen when somebody buys this, he or she, they will have the single copy of the, of the album and this beautiful box. What are they allowed to do with it at, at that point? It's not, well, yeah, to call it a copy means there's something else, a mass or existing. It is basically, we really refer to it as the sole incarnation of the music. It's the sole existing mass. There is no other copy. There is no digital backup. There is literally nothing. The one copy that remains in the vault in Marrakesh is the only existing thing. If that goes, it all goes. Um, and that was a very difficult decision to make for us, to destroy the actual... Let backup. me just rewind there for one second. Yeah. So the CDs that are in this box, that's it. Well, well, I can't tell you whether they're in the box. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. No, well, no, they're not in the box. You seen that security, <laughs> you seen that security, a security guard made yeah, a move yeah. on you right there, They're Sasha. not in there. He's like, hey. <laughs> Watch it, kid. <laughs> okay. Yeah, the insurance policy on this thing is crazy. But, yeah. Um, Wait, let me tell a funny the, story. Hold on, sorry. But I just want to say, hold on. Yo, getting through customs, right? <laughs> <laughs> And, and, and Tariq, oh, is is of, Tariq is of Tariq is of Moroccan descent of, of of the Arab descent, and you know the energy that that's coming from the Arab world right now. How long they had you? They had home three hours. And home they three, was they like, security, you know, yeah. and they were like, what? There's no key, really. There's no key. They had to scan, scan. Well, what scan. what happened is I'm in Homeland Security. Our partner is trying to clear the box. The description on the paper doesn't fit the box because there was no key now on the on the paper it says cow leather bedding uh see the wood and nickel silver now obviously yeah that was the the other box so they're like we're going to seize this because this is not the box you're trying to clear i mean we were a millimeter away from this being gone so this <laughs> three is, days ago this is a miracle and they're calling me in homeland security i'm not allowed to pick up my phone where is the key we need to open the key and the key wasn't there yeah so the, the key is in morocco the key is in morocco yeah that's the tip, so the tip was, for, <laughs> that's a tip for the traveler yeah frequent flyer just tell them traveler. it's in morocco yeah sorry can't so get it right now they didn't care about the value or anything just where's the key it still got scanned upside down and eventually... But you made it through even though they never opened it. Yeah. Wow. Eventually. That's quite, yeah. quite an experience. But to come back to your question, yeah. Right, the soul incarnation. There, there is yeah, one so soul incarnation. Yeah, so there is one. And it's like owning any, any you know, anything that you just, just for you. I mean, it's, he's not allowed to commercialize it. In the beginning, last year, when the story first came out, we said, whoever gets it gets to do what he, what he wants. When we started thinking about it, we felt like if we would allow retail and commercialization and reproduction, this thing would have lived on as, an, as a work of art for 10 months and then become a standard CD. Talking to some art specialists, they said, well, if you're going to sell this as an art piece, you actually not, you, you can't transfer the copyright. It's like a, a painting. You own a painting, you own the canvas, the brush strokes, but you're not really allowed to take pictures of it and sell them as postcards. The, the image copyright remains with the creator. Now, if we were to apply that to this, it would literally never come out. You got it, you can sell it on as a, or, you know, move, trade or whatever you want to do with it to, under the same conditions, but commercialization is definitely off the table. Reza and I then said, well, it shouldn't really stick to just the art world rules and regulations, and it shouldn't really stick to the music world. It's really its own thing. It was, it's a unique thing. It's never been done before. Something like this simply doesn't exist. No one was able to categorize it. The, you know, even discussions with 
copyright lawyers that couldn't figure it out. There were no laws, no rules for how this thing works. So we said it should really write its own destiny and write its own laws. And um, if we want to allow it to come back at a certain age, let's allow it to come back in the next century and remind the world of what hip hop once sounded like. And it's still at the behest of the of the, the owner at that time. I mean, it's not like he has to put it out. Yeah, but there's no, there's no precedent, you know what I mean? And um, so it's, it's basically has to carve its own path. And we'll see yeah. what that evolves. We, you know, we thought of different things, you know, should we put a time limit clause? Which should it, should it be? But I think more importantly um, for me is there is only one. And if, you know, if somebody were to, you know, f take a photo and go and try to make another one <laughs> of the of anything, any part of that, nah, that's only one, y'all. You know, and that's 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 what makes Mona Lisa so special, you know. I've seen it on a lot of TV shows, but I, if I really wanted to see it, I had to go to France. Yeah. And, and that was another thing about this project that that, you know, really engaged me and I was, you know, was the idea to, you know, to tour it as a work of art, you know, to take it to different galleries and, and let them check it out. I'm a, I'm a guy that grew to like art, grew to like the culture, and I take my son to, you know, different galleries, different museums, and I thought it would be great, um, you know, for, the, for, this, for this once upon a time in Shaolin to make his round in that world. But even that is still very unique to that world. And so... And that's not what you guys ended up doing. No. No. This is, this is it. Tonight this is, is it. Tonight is tonight tonight quite a special night. That's it. Yeah. That's the last time the public sees it. First time, last time. That's yes, it. Sir. Yeah. Now, if the person who buys it wants to, can they distribute the music for free? That would be the only option. That would be the only way to do it. Yeah. So it would be up to that human being. Yes. That's kind of a, that's a lot of responsibility. Yeah, hopefully it'll be a philanthropist. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I just imagine <laughs> I just imagine the torrent of emails from Wu Tang fans to this person being like, Please, one track, please. Well, I understand where Wu Tang is like coming an, from. You know, um, I would I would I wouldn't be happy with it. I'm you know, I can totally understand. You wouldn't be happy if what? What what we've done. As For a fan us, you wouldn't be as happy. As a fan, yeah, as a fan. You want to hear it because you want to hear it. Yeah, I think people probably do want to hear, hear it. You want to hear it, but we're like, we're not guess. Guess. Yeah. yeah, but <laughs> it's, a wild guess. it's either that or compromise on our integrity or the integrity of the statement that this thing is making. I mean, it, it's so, you know, so there's a chance that the last or probably the last is that is that how we're saying it for the Wu Tang? We don't know, we don't know. I told you backstage, man. I'm, I'm, I think I'm done, kid. <laughs> anyway. Um, so there's a chance that the general public might not hear it for 88 years. Yeah, that chance is quite big, yeah. That's kind of... Well, right. depending on where it ends up, you know, but mm -hmm. it's just commercially, it's not going to be possible. You just gave me the greatest vision. Right? I don't you know if I'm allowed to say... That's called a, imagine somebody cool like... Like Richard Branson just get this thing and put it on one of his uh, flying, airlines. one of his flying to space airlines, and like, yeah, it's, it's off the planet. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be crazy, right? <laughs> well then, anyway, well, no, that's no, that's fine. <laughs> Definitely, no one's gonna complain then if it's actually in space and it's like, fuck it's it, floating like, up there, kid. <laughs> You definitely won't get hassled if you put it in space. <laughs> That'll slow down the phone calls and just be like... It's going key, and the key's in Morocco anyway, and it's in space, so... <laughs> forget it. Like just forget it. You're never going to hear it. I mean, that's kind of like, for the Wu-Tang, that wouldn't be the worst... I mean, obviously, everyone would love to hear what's in that box. Or not in that box, sorry. Somewhere. And, uh, but in some ways, maybe never hearing it is kind of, kind of a beautiful way to end. I think it's something magical about that, you know. And look, I think in life, you know, 
for, you know, whether you are a fan of someone, whether you hear, you know, we hear great stories about things that, of, that great people did. You know, if you say, oh, George Washington cut down a cherry tree and you go down south and you want to point out the location or, or you, you know, Abraham Lincoln was here, he did that. And we, you know, we travel places to, to, to see things and some things are myths, some things are magic and some things are truth. But it's those things that inspire the next generation, you know? Mm. You know, it's those things, you know, like, like Tariq said, you know, we was in Egypt at the foundation of this idea. And, and if I give a little backstory about him, I met this kid in 1997 in Amsterdam, in Holland. And he was a guy in the crowd just going crazy, bringing the ruckus, and he's just going crazy, all the kids... And at the end of the concert, we had a freestyle session, and I think Meth reaches in and brings him up, and we give him a mic, and he's doing his best, and we're laughing, and it's, and, you know. Do you remember what you said? <laughs> I was beside myself. It was, it was Dirty, actually, who pulled oh, dirty me pulled up. Yeah, up. Yeah, Dirty broke me up. But he was just looking at me. That was actually quite a funny story because I was, it was like looking at yourself, right, doing the thing, and you're just rhyming, and it's just coming out. And Dirty's looking at me laughing. Meth is on the other <laughs> side. And they're looking at Rizzo, who's sitting there. And when I was finished, they were like, oh, you really got to go talk to Rizzo. Because, you know, you're, you know, I was rhyming at the time. I wasn't producing. So it pulls me to the side, introduced me to Rizzo. That's when Rizzo said, you know what? You know, you, you got a good you know, thing going. We're about to open something in Europe. You want to? That was you know, my dream. I couldn't believe it. At that right moment, Dirty has got somebody's girlfriend right on stage. Her boyfriend is right in front of him with all his buddies, and he's pulling down her bra and playing with her breasts. Odie, Odie. And right in front, and looking at him and laughing. And I'm just trying to, you know, I'm talking halfway to Rizzo, and I'm looking at what's happening there, and the guys jump up on stage, and it's bring the ruckus, right? right. It's a fight. And I get pulled away, thrown back. It was the only stage dive I ever did thrown in and lost contact with Rizzo. Couldn't get backstage for two years, trying to come back and forth until eventually I met his mother. Uh, so, <laughs> no, seriously. This, so I don't see this kid until two years later, maybe. He ends in New York City, 99 University at my office. And I guess he was coming there various times. And five he times. meets five times. Okay, five trips. And he meets my mother, who tells me, Listen, I know you're busy, but I, you need to meet this kid. I want you to meet him. She, she demanded <laughs> that I meet him. And, and, and to this day, I think you, you had... He, to this day, I don't know how this guy did it, but he has the only picture that I've seen of Jizza moms, my moms, and Dirty moms together. <laughs> and because my mother and Dirty moms... Is have, that in I the mean, box? No, no. <laughs> is that in the box? <laughs> but... But... You know, I took heed and uh, actually advised you to go to school. That's the advice I gave you. Yeah, just go study entertainment law. I said, go study, yeah. man. You know, we got enough rappers. We need some, 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 some smart lawyers and things. But he went to school and he, and he started a business and he, you know, uh, started Rings and Partners of Business and we did a tour in Europe and he started becoming, becoming a... Uh, it's, it's just, a, just a smart young man who, 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 who learned more than just the music part of hip hop but the business part but who had a dream and when he sprung that dream out on me to produce beats to be that guy to, to take it back to 36 Chambers you know you know, you know I, I, I took you serious you know what I mean because mm -hmm. I know you, you'll do that do what you, you know, do what you say but it's really this whole thing is a result of a fan with a dream and a dream coming to reality. And that's the magic of art. And your mom. <laughs> um, tell me, uh, all of us, that is, briefly about um, who designed and made the box, since we're not going to see it again. Uh, this was designed by a British Moroccan artist called Yahya. And um, I've seen his work in Morocco in the fancier part of, of the hotels. And he, he, um, he usually does lighting, lanterns in a very beautiful way. And uh, for uh, 
mainly royal families and palaces and stuff like that. And I went to his gallery where he had a couple of these things stored up, and I saw these beautiful, it's like a, it was a flat thing, but I don't know how to describe it really, but it had a lot of engravings, very beautifully done. And I met up with him, and I said, you know, uh, we're doing this thing. Would you like to make a box for it? And he didn't understand it. He thought he would have to produce a million uh, boxes. <laughs> <laughs> I really had to hammer it down. Like, no, we're actually just doing one. We just need one. He's like, what do you mean one? He's like, one, just believe me. It's a... And we sat down and talked about the design a bit and um, got 10 of his best friend guys in the, uh, in the factory. This was the work of, this is three months. It is completely hand carved. The smallest saws you've ever seen. I mean, it is literally millimeter work, no machinery whatsoever. And created this, the box the outer box, the, the little box inside, and then the jewel case, I think it was shown uh, earlier. He was a Wu-Tang fan. He was a Wu-Tang fan, actually, yeah, <laughs> he was. You didn't meet him? No, I didn't meet him. I didn't talk to him on the phone. Oh, wow. So, yeah, crafted this uh, for three months, and um, then I sh we took some very cool pictures of it, showed it to Rizzo. And what, what, uh, tell me about the, uh, when you tried to get the, Oh yeah, so when we're doing Is that we, did we sell that before the uh, the yeah, wax the yeah, wax seal? Yeah, the reason yeah, cuz I thought it would be, you know, way cooler to um, it's cool to, have a wax to do seal. a book. Yeah. Yeah, because you know, books are suffering from the same thing, you know, the, the same like music. I mean, they're disappearing, you know, like are we still going to respect the beautiful look of a, uh, you know, leather-bound books and and just, you know, the the knowledge it carries right. and and I said to her, is it like instead of having lyrics on genius, no disrespect, you know, let's, <laughs> let's do it in a book form. <laughs> let's bring out the book, let's have all the lyrics in there, let's have anecdotes of the songs being recorded, how, what happened during the song recordings. Make, it, make the book itself an experience. So we went to a master bookbinder in Serbia who was still practicing this art because it's, you know, quite a dying art and discussed the leather with him and the engravings and everything, had that made. We wanted to have the beautiful certificates made of uh, the certificates of rights, the indenture of the sale, and um, had that made. And then we said, you know what, we should seal it, candle wax seal, like the old days, to make it really official, real periodic. And I couldn't get the seal done because none of the companies would allow it because it was, a, it was the Wu-Tang brand, the, the Wu-Tang logo. Yeah. <laughs> he owns the <laughs> trademark, so... They were like, we're not going to do it. We really had so to. How did you? Oh, okay. Yeah, you have to step in. That was and help nice me of you. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we wanted to keep everything really beautiful and bring out those arts as well the book of, of, of you know, the arts of books and, and, and book binding and, um, and the certificate. Everything had to feel special. It had to right. feel if right you think, with this. If you think about, like, uh, this is take us, you know, New Yorkers who. You know, in the day we would go down and buy vinyl records, whether you was on Bleecker Street, Tower Records, or I'm uh, Rock and Soul, The Wiz. I'm going back now, all right? All right? Yeah, you know what I mean. So you know, a kid goes in there with his with his, with his money, and and he and he buys a record, and he's able to get an album. He's able to break the seal, open it. You know, op read the read the song words, or the you know the producers, the recording, all the linear notes, play the music. All that physicality also has been removed, and this particular project we have here, this particular work of art, it's all those things took it to the maximum. I mean, yeah. to the highest level, you know, the, the lyrics are written out, but we give you a book with it, you know, and, but that the book is made on something that not only... You know, albums left maybe 20 years ago, right? You know, CDs came and, and now they almost had evaporated. But this particular art of making books this way is gone almost, you know? If you could, if you could get 50 people that could do it now. So each thing, even with, 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 uh, with Yaya doing, doing the handcrafted casing, using nickel, silver, all these different things are us... Mm -hmm bringing different worlds of art together to form one piece of art. And that's similar to what Wu-Tang Clan is. If you think about it, you know, it's different MCs, different guys brought together to form that one 
Wu-Tang Clan, which that W represents, you know? And you said there are many different people from the various Wu-Tang offshoots on the record, like Sons of Man, Kill Army. Um, I heard a voice at the end in the, in the last track. Was that a Wu-Tang? Well, that wasn't a was Wu-Tang. Was that Blue, Blue Raspberry? Cher? No. Cher. That was Cher. Cher. Yeah, Cher. <laughs> the Cher. Wow. <laughs> She's really good on Twitter. She was... Um, <laughs> yeah, Cher was um, really so cool. So Cher is in the Wu-Tang clan now. Yeah. She took Dirty's place. Call yeah. Cher is totally... She took, she took Dirty's place. It's done. It's done. Culture is complete. It is now a 360-degree circle. Yeah. No, I th- it's I beautiful. Think for that particular hey. song, we... Uh, we don't need to sell anything. Wait, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I want to ask you a question. Okay. Did you ever have a crush on Cher? <laughs> yeah. All right, then. <laughs> Am I crazy? Of course I do. Let's see. You know what? Uh, not to get on Cher too much, but it's always some people... No, it's okay. Let's keep going. Yeah, it's, no, it's some people that's like, it's one girl like that, right? It's, like, I haven't seen another one of her. It's like, that's like, who the heck made... Like, Sade. Like, who made that woman? It's like, they... That's it, kid. It's a one-shot deal with that. You know One-shot I mean? deal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, one-shot deal. But I'm serious, though. I mean... Sure. Anyway, yeah, sure. Yeah, right. So Sade on there too or no? No, no Sade. No, we're going to... I'm not bidding. Forget uh, it. Hi, Sade. <laughs> nah. I'm a big fan of hers, kid. Yeah. All right, anyway, back to you. Now you got me all distracted. <laughs> um, so, um, so Cher is on there. Um, twice, yeah. Twice? Yeah. Okay, what, since we're not likely going to be listening to this in a week or two, no, or a well, year, she's like, actually, who she's else not is... singing twice. She's singing one, she's acting in another. In acting? Skit. Yeah. We have okay, her actually well, acting a role she's out. She's a great actor. Yeah, she's a great no, she's actor. Excellent. I think she's an Oscar winning actress, even. Crossing the Lansing. Oh, you know, you're trying to be a director. Hey. See, now the guy, you know, he's studying me as a producer, now he's studying me as a director. What are you doing here, okay? <laughs> you said you're, a, you're making a movie right now, right? Oh, yeah, I am. Uh, we'll Are you at talk. liberty to? Uh, I could talk. It? I could talk a little bit about it. Uh, it's it's really continuing the same concept I've been talking about, which is the best way you know to express art. Another form of art, uh, the word itself is art. You know, spoken word, whether it's rap, whether it's talk, uh, whether it's an oratory, whether it's a speech writer. And so I'm doing a film that will reveal the artistic nature of words. Uh, the working title um, that we, you know, the screenplay uh, is titled It Doesn't Have to Rhyme. And I'm doing it with uh, Lionsgate and we're going to have a unique cast in it. and I'm, I'm aiming, doing my best to shoot it right here in New York City, you know, and bring, because uh, I think New York, the way we talk, yo, you know, <laughs> it's, this is one of the places you're going to really find artistic expressions of words, and uh, so I'll be doing that. And you said you uh, you had a meeting recently with somebody who might be in the movie. Oh yeah, I met with one of the greatest wordsmiths, you know, from 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 my genre, uh, Rakim. Uh, anybody there know who Rakim is? <laughs> exactly, you know. Um, yeah, he has a. Uh, you know, I went to talk to him about adding some of his words and some of his wisdom into this, uh, into this film. So, anyway, that's, we, I'm going to come back and talk to you about that. I'm gonna, you know, uh, we got a date coming up in the summer, right? Yeah. Man, this guy got a date. It's, it's plutonic. <laughs> that's the right word, plutonic? Yeah, I think tonight is the right word. Yeah. Okay. It's definitely going to be plutonic. Okay. <laughs> I'm definitely going to make sure it's plutonic. Is there... Um, in, in closing, is there something you want to say about what you guys did musically? Because, because we won't have access to that. Is there something you want to say about what happened in in the production that felt to you, I don't know, that made you feel like you had completed the goal you wanted to go for? Because you began on the pyramids, which is a pretty, that's a big place to start. That's a little heavy. So you got to the point where you felt like you had fulfilled that vision. What what happened along the way musically? Were there moments that stick out to you where you, where you thought, well, this is, I feel good about sealing it in this insane, beautiful thing it was, and it was the time, shooting it into space? It was the time it took. That's the when time. we knew we were, yeah. It wasn't like, 
it wasn't easy. I mean, I remember songs we worked seven months on, just messing about with the snare for three months. You know, it was almost like Quincy's approach to beat it. I mean, not beat it, uh, Billy Jean. Remember how he was trying to, for three months, trying to make sure that whenever you heard that boom, come in, everybody in the world would know what it was. It was almost like that. We obviously don't have anything as great as Billy Jean. I mean, but um, it was the, it was just the how intense every track was. I mean, the tracks are not songs; they're really an experience. Each one, each track, from the interludes to how we used to do them back in the days, to the songs, to the intro, to everything was really a lot of work, months. And I think one thing uh, for me, you know. Over the recent years, having uh, different, mm, different, I guess, opinions or different uh, reactions from my Wu-Tang brothers in regards to my ideas and my direction of music, uh, this is cohesive. So to have everybody in the crew, you know, agree that this is official. That's, uh, you know, that hasn't happened for a long time. And uh, I'm glad that it has happened. And the person who, who uh, possesses this, he's going to get that energy. Uh, he's going to get that spirit of, of knowing that this is, this is confirmed, authentic. This is real, you know. For me, the most important thing as well is that people know that the main goal is to inspire with this. And if it, you know, it's a radical approach. It's the extreme approach, right? It's the complete opposite of everything that's happening right now. If you look at the music industry, trying to sell the most records, we're almost like saying, trying to sell the least. And we hope that something as extreme as that and radical will resonate, because that's the only way it will actually resonate around the world, that it is that one copy. That's what everybody was talking about. That's why it was so fa such a fascinating and an intriguing subject to discuss. And we really hope it will inspire artists in the way we perceive music and hopefully reattach not just monetary values, but also artistic values, experiential values that you used to have with that bond you used to have with the physicality of music. Because this is not a solution to the problem, but hopefully it will inspire that debate that will lead to new ways and reattach that, that experience with music again. That's what this really is. That's what we're really trying to achieve. So one person is going to connect with that physicality. It ain't the point that one person connects, right? He's connected with it. He connects with it personally as a possession, but the existence of it connects with everybody, you know? Exactly. You know, it's like the Statue of Liberty sits there in the middle, you know, the Hudson, right? Yeah. Or the East River, depending on how you call it, but sits there in the middle. And people from around the world, is one of it. It's only one. And then you come and you finally see it. My son saw it for the first time last winter. Took him on the Staten Island Ferry. And he looked at it like, wow. Like, wow, yo. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's, you know, the... I, I, I'm gonna keep going back to this is definitely a marker in history. It's a marker in time, and uh, um, it will inspire you. I'm letting you know I that all the time. Yeah. It will inspire. I think it already started. Yeah. People could go to Times Square and get little keychains with like little <laughs> imitation boxes and be like, "I went to New York, man. I was somewhere near the box, sort of." This guy, yeah, see, that's a, see, that's a, that's merch. That's a, that's 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 deep right there. That's a, some entrepreneurs. Right there. <laughs> let's, uh, let's close on a deep note. I just yeah. want to thank everyone for coming out and uh, being part of this very magical moment right here. Yeah, we wanna... yeah, thank Sorry. you all. Thanks to the MoMA. Thank you, guys. Yes, I want to. I'm gonna take the time to thank. Uh, I'll take the time to thank the staff at MoMA for allowing us to uh, share this event with you. Uh, thank the team at Padaway, you know, and knowing that we. Our trust in to put this in your hands to do and take it down its proper route. I want to thank you, Sasha, for coming and talking. This guy always gives me a tough time. He took it easy tonight on me. Uh, thanks, Tyreek. You know what I mean? Traveling over. Thank you. And definitely thank everybody for coming out. Thanks to uh, Power 105 for 
Uh, or, the, or who, who won uh, tickets here today or whatever? Bong, bong. Thanks, yo. Bong, bong. More, yeah, 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 yeah. Angela Yee and them crazy people in the morning. Thanks, thanks to them. And, uh, yo, let's keep, let's keep doing what we can to promote the arts, promote the music, yo. And uh, build a better world. Peace. Thank you. And, and thank you to Jim Toth and his team for the sound. <laughs>